The great cricketer is a Twitter stream. It's about playing crickets at the grade level. Boys! Get a few today, did you? To be honest with you, I, um, I hate grade cricket. <laughs> uh, I'm going to do the play for a team call. Um, oh, the name is Kid. Obviously, sharing is always a big issue, a big issue for, for young kids coming into a senior cricket team. I was like a win league. Um, a bit of advice. So yeah. That's what I want. I refer to the great cricketer here and I'll say, this will do a little bit early. <laughs> 36. 30. Fucking 6. Australia systematically dismantled the Indian cricket team with a humiliation that most of us have already pretty much forgotten about, but will long live in the memory of our Indian friends. We do what we always do after another historic assess for the Australian cricket team. We pick apart the flaws and the weaknesses of the Australian team that just bowled out Coley, Pajara, et al., for 36 cricket runs. Who plays the next test and why? How good are second innings runs? Will COVID deny a Sydney non-dead rubber test? Are India absolutely gone? Was that fielding coach at a wedding this week? And will Tim Payne cure COVID? Dan Christian hits a 15 ball, 50 in the BBL. Jacques Callis joins England in preparation for Sri Lanka. New Zealand are still good at home. And Shane Warne's wearing a hat now. Michael Bevan is on the show to discuss throwing 1,400 runs in a Shield season, hitting fours off the last ball on New Year's Day against the West Indies and wearing full kit in the shower after a low score. Hashtag AskTDC asks if securing a chop equals a superior circuit and should you play cricket you enjoy or cricket you can be proud of. This episode is brought to you by Budgie Smuggler. You can get all your Christmas gifts, your smugglers, your accessories. It's not too late listener out there. Use the code CHAMP at checkout. That's budgiesmuggler.com. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash cry cricket for more exclusive content every single week. My name is Ian Higgins. I'm joined by Sam Perry. Pezzy lad, 36. Fuck. Hell yeah. 36. I know. Low. It's not many. Mm. Not many. Um, now, after this record breaking, uh, for, first of all, Merry Christmas to you and yours. And, and to you and yours, the things that you won. Yeah, yes. After this record breaking win, when India have been bowled out for the lowest score in the history of their uh, international playing days, are we happy? Are we happy now? And by we, do you mean Australians? Speak for the nation, all? as you often do. Yes, okay. Yes. This I, is can only, I can only answer that with a story. Uh, with a f- <laughs> Yeah, of course, of course, yes. I'd like to tell you where I was when the wickets fell. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so my family has gone down the coast. My wife and two boys have gone down the coast. Right. And, um, and hopefully they're having a wonderful time. Mm-hmm. And it's some rare solitude for, um, for Papa. Papa Perry, <laughs> not to be not to be confused with Dada or Papi, <laughs> yeah, or okay. my puppy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, okay. For Papa Perry, yes, uh, and Papa Perry, and so I took the opportunity. Pizza joint. I took the opportunity during this time. I got to the gym, had a sort of a, a long time at the gym, and then nice. I came home. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're not actually promoting Manscaped this week, mm-hmm. but I Manscaped, <laughs> and I and I groomed, right? Okay. And so I was watching the cricket sort of on the TV in my right. lounge room, mm. and then I took my phone into the bathroom and like uh, hoisted it up mm. and uh, and watched the rival network mm. and, uh, and and groomed. I was manscaping basically right. and, and just grooming myself, you know, shave the old hair. And one of the ironies of being bald is you have to tend to your hair that you don't have more often than those with hair. Right. And so basically I was nude and manscaping while all of these wickets were falling. Oh, my God. Right. And uh, – How did you do it with an erect penis? <laughs> It's actually easier to shave. <laughs> tight around it's the edges. Easy. Yeah, Manscaped provides that as well. <laughs> Not that we're promoting them this week. Right. And it kind of, you asked me how it made me feel. It reminded me of a lesson. In my mm. latter days of my cricket career, mm. playing grade cricket, I had a wonderful coach, um, Mark Atkinson. Right? Mm. I played for Tassie. He was mm. a coach of mine. Worked with him as well. Mm-hmm. And I remember saying to him, I just don't feel happy. Like, cricket doesn't make me happy. I feel happy playing cricket. He said, you don't play cricket to be happy. You play cricket for satisfaction. Mm-hmm. Satisfaction's better than happiness. Right. And I thought, oh, that's nice. That's nice. That's a nice way to think about it. You play for satisfaction. Mm-hmm. And when I think about these wickets and I think about manscaping at the same time, mm-hmm. I was both happy and satisfied. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't happen very often in cricket. Um, <clears throat> but the difference between Australians and other countries, he goes, mm-hmm. is this. When other countries achieve record-breaking, historic kind of results, yeah. England, South Africa, you know, England gets us out for 60. Mm. South Africa got us out for 47. Mm-hmm. You feel like monum- cultural monuments are built to those uh, events, especially in England. They know how to celebrate a win. Oh, fuck yeah. To be fair to them. Yeah. They know how to celebrate one. They yeah. really go for it. And to celebrate other teams' losses. 100%. They're just yeah. good at uh, commemorating the entire thing. Sometimes yes. it goes on and on and on. Sometimes. Yeah. And in yeah. Australia, we're the reverse. Yeah. You know? We're just like, let's let's move on to the next thing. Yeah. What's next? Um, 
Because Australian cricket is actually the whole story, the entire <laughs> narrative of Australian cricket is about rebuilding Steve Waugh's side again. Yeah. There's a thing in Australian sport, a phenomenon in Australian sport, not just cricket, where mm. if a sport reaches a particular benchmark, mm -hmm. that then becomes the benchmark by which everybody else is judged. Right. We'll never be good at the Olympics again. Yeah, the, because right, of okay. the 2000 Olympics. Yes, of course, yeah. We're never going to be good at football again because mm. the 06 side hasn't been beaten yet. Mm. You know, there's squash, that, like, Heather Mackay. Heather Mackay. Or whatever. And, and we always talk about that. We always do. Yeah. And it's the same with cricket. Yeah. I mean, that 2000 side mm -hmm. was, that was worldies mm -hmm. all through. But we can enjoy the 36. Yeah. But we'll continue. But the, most of the conversation will be about who's opening once Warner's back. Was Burns going to play? Yeah. <laughs> Has Ted scored enough? He didn't score 150, as Mark Taylor asked. <laughs> He do. <laughs> Mate, so, it's, it's so true. Yeah. So I'm trying to enjoy the 36, which I watched nude, manscaping. Yeah. But I still want Tugger's side. Yeah, of course. Okay. Well, all okay. that makes sense. All that makes sense. Now, before we get into um, the first test where we dissect, well, we dissect all the wickets um, and somehow Tim Payne getting mad at the match when Josh Hazel took five for three. <laughs> Good 73 yeah. to be fair. Yeah. Red ink. Yeah. Red ink. Um, but uh, a quick little shout out for Patreon, Pez. Yes. Uh, let me jump into this. Now, Ben, we, we spoke to Ben Lockling a couple of weeks ago. We posted that last week. That's a great interview. A 22 minute little job there. And uh, for those people who, who are patrons uh, at patreon.com forward slash Craig Cricketer, they can uh, hashtag us to say Fridays, obviously. We're up to episode 20 now. 20 yeah. of those bad boys. When you sign up, you get the whole access to the entire archive. But we're going to release that on Thursday this week because Christmas yeah. Day is a Friday. Indeed. And no one's listening to this shit on Friday. Mm. Well, yeah, they might be. Well, they well, a lot of people are locked down as well. So. That's true. Yeah. That is true. Anyway, so that'll come out on Thursday this week. Anything to add there? Not really. The Ben Lachlan interview was good. It's funny. It, was, he, funny. it is funny. He talks about his dad who actually played test mm. cricket, but then yeah. it's, yeah. I mean, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a bit of dad stuff going on there and mm -hmm. he and he leans into it. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's good on the new rules as well in the BBL. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, can only commend it. Someone wrote in asking if he has the, one of the nicest eyes in Australia. Yeah. He does have nice eyes. That the, matches the teal. The teal. Like, yes. Yeah. Yes. Lachlan's eye. And there's a lot of talk about, you know, Paddy Cummins, Baby Blues, and of course we're not going to um, disrespect them. No, no. Uh, a lot of talk about Stoinis, but yeah. Now that Lachlan has gone from the strikers to the teal of the Brisbane Heat, those eyes mm. are really popping, baby. Mm -hmm. And no one's taken more wickets. So it's a pretty good combination from Ben Lachlan's perspective. Patreon.com forward slash Grey Cricketer. Um, now, Pez, I don't know if you caught this, but uh, India were bowled out for 36. Yeah, I did. I did. Um, now, I was I, naked. I, <laughs> I, um, it's, uh, uh, he, he, here, are, here are my critiques of the game. Okay. <laughs> I think we've been robbed a bit because that was going to be a great test match. And, Amen. okay, it's going to be one of the most memorable yep. until the next game. Yep. Um, but that was lined up for one of the great tests. I messaged yeah. you on maybe beginning of day three or something, and I was like, maybe every test should be day night. Because then you think of me, the amount of games where, like, I think you, you even did a, a tweet from your personal account saying that, you know, in Australia, if you get ahead in the first innings and the game's gone, really. A which, lot of which, the can, which can be true in other countries as well, but it just seems very pronounced in Australia. But, like, mm -hmm. you just. If you win the toss in your bat and you get a score, that's it. It's yeah. all over. First to Whereas 500. This was a game which, you know, it's just good to see where the bowls are in it in Australia. Of course. Yeah, that's where it's good to see. And, and you know, maybe it's spoiled. Of course it's spoiled. But, like, teams shouldn't get 500 mm -hmm. in the first innings. It's just, it's not that exciting to watch anymore. Mm. Yeah, because I've, I've seen that. I want to see, like, when it's about 200, 250. That's why cricket in England's so good because bowlers can just fucking swing a game in an hour like Broad does, like Anderson has in the last 20 years or whatever. Before before the fateful day where they bowled him out for 36. Now known as the fateful day. The fateful day. Yeah. Uh, I had Greg Chappell's words like ringing in my ears because <laughs> I was just consistently playing the interview we did with him just over and over. <laughs> right, yeah. But I had his words ringing in my ears about the skill of Indian cricketers because ahead of day three, India, as everyone knows, is ahead by 50 runs. <laughs> Australia had played quite well until that point on a home track. They'd bowled quite well, relentless lengths. Again, we were already cooing over the relentless lines and lengths. I'm going to talk about lengths in a like second. Like a pigeon, Pez. Um, of, this, of Australia's quicks. Nathan Lyon looked dangerous on day one. It was mm. a pink ball. Ponting was uh, predicting balls going through the gate. Now, I think he got... I don't think he went quite through the gate with Prithvi Shaw. He actually nicked it onto the stumps. And yeah. like, uh, like fucking big call, Ricky. What? Stark swings it in, does he? <laughs> <laughs> Different to show RT, Ponting, Ponting <laughs> wines. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But it was the nature of India's dominance to that point. Right. You know, they Australia had just hung in there. They'd only hung in there as a result of fucking third grade fielding. Mm -hmm. uh, they'd only hung in there because Rahane absolutely burnt Kohli. I don't know why runouts are about setting someone on fire, but that's the metaphor of choice. Mm -hmm. um, Kohli was head and shoulders above, and I thought, fuck, like India, um, India have come to play. We thought that 
Warner and Smith were the difference in 2018. Mm -hmm. And, in fact, India had got better. And then this all happened. And now most of the chat around the media, which is obviously, you know, the barometer of everyone's thoughts. Yeah, yeah, of course. Is that uh, India are dead and buried, shattered. Mate, that's, like that's, that's what wrist. it means. Well, fuck me. Yeah, as soon as I saw that, I was like, well, that's a broken arm. Yeah, now they tried to like, massage it. Fuck. Oh, my God. I'm going to massage God. the bone back in. You know, you're going to tape them, I'm going to tape, we'll tape, we'll tape that up. Fucking hell, that was brutal. Yeah, but mate, you're right. I mean, because every batsman, just one thing, every every Aussie bat mm. was wasn't just dismissed. They were like tortured before they were dismissed. It was all sort of this bloke can't get one off the square. He can't get Steve Smith. We saw what Steve Smith will look like a year out from his retirement. Um, <laughs> yeah. Can't get one off the square. Labuschagne was out 87 times before he made his 40. Yeah. The only one who didn't was Green, yeah. big old mitts. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But even he was beaten with pace by Ashwin. Yeah. Mm. Um, and then yeah, the thirty six is kind of is it is it kind of uh, what's, what's the word sticking a band aid over some stuff? Is it is it plugging a yeah. few gaps there? Is yeah, it band aid over some cracks, mate. Yeah. Maybe maybe. Over some well, it, 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 felt, it felt like it because um, India India won that game many many times. Yeah, they they won the game many times. Uh, yeah, Kohli and and Rahane batting very well in, into mm. the night. India were what three for one eighty, all mm. out two fifty. Um, dropped Labuschagne heaps of times. Maybe Australia they could have been rolled as well if it wasn't for Payne's clean seventy three runs. Now Payne has now gone part. He's now averages higher than what Brad Haddon did, and he's yeah. now the highest averaging. He's the second highest averaging wicketkeeper in Australian Test cricket history, which I feel like our UK listeners might be like, what the fuck. What's he averaging? He's 30 something. But that just speaks to my theory. It's like Gilchrist is the benchmark, so everyone's yeah. shit. Yeah, much shit. Same with Warren. Yeah. Yeah. Lion <laughs> averages 30. <laughs> it turns up occasionally. 400, 400 wickets. Yeah. That's Australia. <laughs> Spins the wrong way. <laughs> um, it, you know, is it fair? Is it fair? Nothing's fucking fair. Nothing's fair. Is it fair for. Pain. Was pain 73 the deciding fact? It might have been, actually. Well, it helped them it. hang in there. Like Everyone was saying if India get 120 ahead, there's a different psychology going to third innings. I mean, it was a great... What were Australia, 5 for 80 or something? Something like that, yeah. And it, wasn't, got, it wasn't good. No, it wasn't many. I think it was also the um, like the skill of Payne's innings. I mean, he didn't... It wasn't jammy. Like He actually played positively. It, he almost it was in complete contrast to everyone who came before him. His batting's improved. It was almost like the sort of prodigy runs we expected from Payne when he started his career. Mm. And we've had a lot of feedback this week. About Fucking four or five hell. people have lined up to yeah. gleefully let us know yeah. that the term prodigal runs doesn't mean what we think it means. Now, I, d I didn't read to the end of all of those things once the criticism came in because I'm an insecure bloke. Of course. Other than to say that, yeah, I mean, there was one university professor who wrote in, or, or some, their son wrote in and said, oh, my mum was listening and said, oh, these blokes are not as smart as you think they are. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Why do they both think we're smart? But anyway, Good, yeah, yeah. It's, it's not prodigal runs. Okay, sorry. We've been saying it for fuck. We've said, said, been saying for two years, and fucking five people just bashed the door down. Mm. Anyway, um, but yeah, Payne's innings was very, very good. Was it five for three? Hmm. It wasn't five for three. I've seen many seventy three not out. So I reckon. I've seen many five for threes. I reckon Cummins and Hazelwood probably should have. One probably of them probably won the, the game. Match. Yeah, the game was won when we bowled them out for thirty six. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of love for Payne, oh, just with what he's done now, as a skipper. Pez, so it's skipper seventy three and five. five Pez, catches. Don't get me wrong. If that didn't make you want to stand up on your school desk yeah. and scream, "Captain, my captain!" Yeah. Then you're into the wrong sport. Mm. You're into the wrong gear. Didn't it fucking look good? He's how, how come he tucks his pants in so well? Even that looks good. The waist right. looks good. Everything's right. The sleeve is just so. Yeah. All of it's good. The back foot punches. Mm, sumptuous. The corner of that popped collar just touches his cheek. Mm, just caresses. Just rubs and caresses that cheek, mm. which is beautifully shaved, by the way. <laughs> he's, got, he's, got, he's got a five-step skin regime. It has, it, he'd be up to four or five steps. I know, fucking look good, play good, feel good. That's, mm. that was, that was, that's what that innings was all about. It was. And he must have. Um, now, Hazelwood. Uh, yes. He got went past 200 test wickets. He's the 18th Australian to do so. Mitchell Stark was on 248 test wickets. Yeah. He's he's now level with Benno. Yeah. Disrespectful. Yeah, we, we posed the question on our Channel 7 show, is that disrespectful now to if he goes past Benno at the mm. MCG? For disrespectful Day? to Garth McKenzie. Yeah, well, of course, he did go past, yeah. Mm. Now, there's been a couple – there's been a bit of chat about uh, – and obviously Cummins doing so well as well, um, although he did go for 20 runs in that third inning, so a little bit loose, a little bit loose. But obviously he rested from the ODIs in the T20s, and he was saying, I, I, I couldn't have had a better preparation. Mm. Um, but where are the runs? Where, where pack runs, runs, you know? Exactly. Yeah. I got to say, Stark's a better bat than Cummins. Yeah. Star Stark's got ten fifties. I looked this up yesterday, yeah. and come and Cummins has two. Cummins averages sixteen. 
And Stark average is like 25, almost 30, I think. Both of them have been better bats early in their career, you'd mm. have to say. Mm. St- Stark offered more with a bat, still hits a very clean ball. But yeah, neither. I mean, they're just focusing on the bowling and doing quite well, I, I presume. Mm. Cummins tends to step up with the bat when he's needed. and He's, he's not more technically silly. correct. Yeah. But Stark will get you the runs mm. that we don't need. Mm. Um. <clears throat> Anyway, so there's been a bit of chat about there's been a bit of chat about um, you know is this the greatest bowling attack that we've ever had? Uh, ah, it's a bit. Come on, yeah, come on, come on. It's not two thousand, is it? Come on, it's not, not yeah. two thousand. Yeah. All right, now let's get into the main let's get into the main talking point here. Let's talk, so, are we talking about Hazelwood Cummins for a sec because with Hazelwood, there's a lot of chat now around like he's still underrated. It's true, he is still underrated. He needs more. He, he needs to be higher rated. Like a Who great, is Hazelwood, Josh Hazelwood. Oh, I uh, agree. He's king. Uh, bring a like he's a great cricketer's cricketer. I would say. I don't want to speak on behalf of all grade cricketers, though we've d- deigned to do that for about eight years. <laughs> um, very cautiously. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah. talking to a mate of mine who played a lot of first grade, did very well, and he used to say to me, like, playing Sydney first grade cricket, mm-hmm. he's like, I'm not very good. And he was good. He was a good player. 250 weeks. Nathan Ball. I'll just say his name. Mm. Very, very good player. Mm. He got um, me up. He, Okay. Oh, he played against him, did you? <laughs> um, <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone got me up. Um and he would say, and I'm sort of paraphrasing for him here, but like he didn't like playing first grade cricket against test cricketers when he mm. felt like he could compete against those test cricketers. He's like, I shouldn't be able to compete against these right. guys. There are certain right. guys who would right. play. I'm not going to name any names. Like, I shouldn't be able to get you out. I shouldn't be able to face you. You're playing for fucking Australia. Mm. He's like, but when Hazelwood played, it's like, yeah, 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 he's yeah. a big boy. Thoroughbred. He's a thoroughbred. Like, yeah. oh, you don't you don't play in this grade. Yeah. Get out of here. Yeah. Go and play with the boys. Go and play with the big boys. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> But he didn't want to compete again. And I think a lot of great cricketers feel that way. Like you'd see Hazelwood yeah. kicking around and you'd be like, yeah, that's the stuff. Hazelwood's, that's, that's Hazelwood's the a year 12 kid playing in like the under 13s. Yeah. Like, get out of here. Mate, there's like great cricketers are, are the like least forgiving judges of cricketers. There's a there's a clip going around. I'm not going to say any names. A clip going around from a couple of weeks ago mm. of a first class cricketer bowling mm. uh, in a great cricket match. And you can, and because my cricket's doing all the streams. Right. And you can hear someone go, how the fuck do this bloke get a game in first class cricket? Mate. And it's fucking so harsh. So Mate, man, how many of you play? What about the Peskovsky thing that's going on yesterday? Yeah, yeah. He's, he's twelve and he's like he's watching Steve Smith bat at the MCG in one of Smith's first games. How old's it must be ten years ago? So yeah, like beginning he's, of Smith's he's career. 12, yeah. And uh and uh and he's just like And Smith's hitting hundreds. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and what does Pekovsky say? Something like is, is, how's is this bloke like, get a game? How's this bloke get runs with a technique like that? <laughs> just the language of Exactly that. of a twelve. He's 12. Year old. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this bloke got a game. So if Will Bukowski's talking about Steve Smith like that at 12 years old, imagine being Will Bukowski's mate and being 12 years old at the time. <laughs> Fucking this bloke. <laughs> What's this bloke? But that, that's like great cricketers are very unforgiving judges. So And Hazelwood, I just think, is like the um, – he, he's he, loved and celebrated. He's, he's winks. Yeah, he's winks. Yeah. You know, like um, I was thinking about Hazelwood this morning uh, and he's just the fucking – he's just beaten the game. Like he's just like in Australia, the length he hits – where the fuck do you hit it? Mate. Where uh, are you going? You getting the front foot? Are you? Nah, fuck. That's going through your chest. Go? Where do you go? He doesn't bowl. Mm. Isn't bowls, bowls a decent bumper? It's good mm. pace. It's yeah. what what high 130s, one forties. Um, he can change up. He's pace, quicker yeah. than what you think. Is yeah. like he can bowl at mid one forties. And the height it comes from you know severe height. And it's just a fucking trampoline. It's yeah. just hitting a length variable bounce. Mate, if you're India and you play on decks where like that length gets to about your knee. Mm. Uh, and then all of a sudden it's going through your chest. Like, how do you hit it? Where, he bowls where do you a hit narrow it? corridor of wet paint and that ball ain't getting wet. Any stump he wants to hit. I was doing some Christmas shopping the other day in yeah, the city. Mate. Well, yeah. Yeah, working, walking through the city for the first time in a oh, year. Oh, some gifts for you, mate. Yeah. Oh, I got a bit of money, do you? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was just after the 30, well, it was the day after the 36, and uh, I, I, saw a, I saw a shop. It's called Forever, Forever Lengths. <laughs> Hair extensions. <laughs> I just thought, it doesn't make sense, but Cummins and Hazelwood were bowling forever lengths. What the fuck does that just, mean? I, I don't know. I don't know, but the length is a forever length. What length does he bowl? Just fucking... It's just forever. For, mate, that, That's he, will, good. he will bowl that length forever. It's a hair extension shop. I yeah. think it was closed. Yeah. But, uh, it's forever lengths. He bowls, they, they both bowled forever lengths. Yeah. I don't oh, know. That's, that's red hot. I don't know. That's is red it? hot. Now, have India played four day chess again with us, and just they decide to bowl short to Joe Burns when he he just fucking can't hit anything on the stumps or just nick him oh, off. Let's mate. bowl short. Let's, let's let's give him fifty. Let's mate. give him fifty in the second dig. Never say fucking second innings runs don't count again. You know what? I tweeted about this last night, but like all reports now that Warner's about a five percent chance of playing, so Burns and Wade will probably play again. Oh, really? Right. Oh, so okay. he's flown in, but he's 
everybody's no saying he's no good. I don't know. Uh, who knows? So okay. all of the Burns Wade stuff might Mate, just have to be put on ice for the second MCG test. Got to say, if that's if if he does play, if, if they're just like winding it up, yeah. there's no like surprise element of yeah. like because they have to announce the team. Mm. It's like doing a calf stretch an hour and a half before the game before you do anything. Yeah. It's like they have to list the team what, what half an hour before the actual game starts. Mm. They're not going to be they're not going to be fucking freaking out like oh we didn't prepare for Warner. He yeah. just, it's cricket. It's cricket, guys. Yeah, it's cricket, guys. Like this, this, <laughs> this fifty from Burns, and like yeah. good luck to him. Good luck to him. Yeah, it's uh, it's getting its context from him being unable to score a run for three months. It's almost like it's in contrast to averaging three. It's like Boomer's fifty. You know, Boomer averaged yeah, three. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, how good is he? It's like yeah. it, it's uh, no, he still averages three. You know, you know, like we said, like the, you know, it's it's it, he's he's had a masterclass here, Burns. Because yeah. have you noticed what he's saying in the media since as well? Like he, he's really pumping up the bond between Burns and Langer now. Like I just I noticed yesterday who is Burns. Okay. He, he he described his fighting fifty one not out as our innings. Oh my god! No, that's fucking that's genius. Go- go- it is genius. I don't pick him for it for like a media genius. You notice after the after the game after the innings he hit the winning runs. He had the um the interview with the. Sort of scary fox spider cam come yeah, up yeah, to his yeah. face. He kept his Aussie lid on. Hundred percent. He's he's very like a laconic um, mm. figure. You know, he's like he reminds me of like a Pete Murray. He's Pete you know? Murray. Yeah, he's Pete Murray. I've oh, talked about that before because uh, we were saying beforehand like he's G hasn't scored a lot of runs, and there's only two reasons you get picked in sides. Mm. You know, you have to <laughs> score runs or you've got a big penis. How big is it, Joe? <laughs> How big is it? What are we talking? He's here? Wall Street banks. You know, he's too big to fail. <laughs> His Lehman Brothers, <laughs> 2008, which was actually about Darren Lehman. <laughs> Lehman Brothers. He had a brother. He was the, less the, ba- the banks bailed him out. Jo- uh, Joe banks Bur- did bail Joe him Burns out. He's still got a job. <laughs> Joe Burns is too big to fail. <laughs> Isn't the Brisbane Heat sponsored by a bank? Uh, anyway, yeah. Well, look, Wade's going to get another crack, it seems, if Warner's uh, not fit. So. Mate, I, I just I love the idea like he's fixed now. He ain't fixed. I'm sorry, Burns ain't yeah. fixed. I, like you know, I, and I've got nothing against him. Yeah, good luck. Good to luck him. to him. He's got four test hundreds. He's mm. a good player. Yeah, averaging thirty eight open batting. Nothing wrong with that. It's yeah. pretty good. Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, it's not Steve Waugh two thousand benchmark good. It ain't Matthew Hayden. Yeah, and unless it is, we're unless not happy it is, yeah. until it is. Getting that, getting not, that bench press. It's a. Oh, I feel like it's a. Bit I just slight. He, he just ain't the answer for me. He just ain't it. He yeah. ain't it. In the same way that I, th- will I you th- help him? Ke- will you will you allow him to keep the seat warm though? Nice warm bottom while Pekowski gets fit. Like he's a good seat warmer. I, here's the thing. I was thinking about last night because I was thinking. Like, I think it's pretty harsh on Marcus uh, Boogie Harris. The Boogie, yeah. Um, to not get a game, given that he scored also 200 in the Shield. He then scored a couple. He scored another 70. But it was it was he shadowed. Missed out, he it missed was, down the tour games. He was shadow. It was sort of. Um, it was overshadowed by Pukowski scoring just buckets of runs. Mm. But is is Harris so obviously the answer over Burns? No, he's not. No. But I'm, I guess what I'm thinking is that I just want someone who doesn't exist to be better, and yeah. they probably don't exist a bit. And maybe, and maybe the answer is that, like, mm, in the absence of a worldy coming in, we'll just keep the guy who's we'll just keep the guy who's who's the incumbent, and he'll just do the job. That's probably the answer. Don't let perfect be the enemy of good, right? You know, right. And good luck to Joe Burns. Fields at one, like we said, looks good. Mm. It is, nice it, guy. it is it is political though. It is and it isn't as simple as like oh whoever scores more more runs get gets in. Like it this to me is like the opposite of those players who might feel happy to miss that Indian tour where they're going to average nine playing on dust bowls where they don't know which way the ball's spinning because mm. everyone's statistics are going to suffer. They may be looking at like two like back to back tests on the most placid, lifeless, dead eyed wicket yeah. in the history of the world. Yeah. With India possibly psychologically shattered yeah. going, it is time no to cash in. It is time to put cash in the bank mm. of my runs. Mm. If if Burns can get himself a 70 or an 80, he's good. Good yeah. to go. Even an out of form 70 or 80. Mm. So I just can't it, so, so like, yeah, well, but the MCG wicket's pretty fucking dead, dude. Like uh, oh, yeah, yeah. guys can score runs. And Same you know, they're going to have a debutante uh, bowling for them as well. Yeah, true, true, true. But as long as Boomer is there with that new pill, I'm still thinking like, hmm. Oh, you think it's a matter of time for Burns? He's just going to get sorted out. Like, is he not yeah. up to the level? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. I do think that. Yeah, I do think that, which might be true. But he's also too big to fail. But and exactly, so he's got that. How second, big is it? He's got the second line of defense. Fucking, how big is it? He's scoring mm. our runs with JL. Mm. He's too big to too fail. Too big to fail. 
He's doing his fucking interview. He's bailed out on. by the banks. Fuck me. There's a, there's a story. <laughs> We're just covering the stories you don't hear about. Who's more Langer-esque, Wade or Burns? Because Burns has now got the arm guard. He's getting injured. He's opening the batting. He's scoring our runs with Justin Langer. But Matthew Wade is a team player, team contributor, to contributor, nuggety little left-hander, like scored mountains of runs to get back in the side. Well, he fields at short legs. So who's yeah. more Langer? I see. I thought Wade would be more Langer. So did I. But it seems to, uh, Burns is putting on a bit of a media show he to is. show that he's Langer. Well, Simon O'Donnell said that um, that um, what's his name Matthew Matt, Wade. Matt Wade has signed his own death warrant yeah, by being too nice. Yeah, I was looking at Wade's numbers. He he averages thirty, and he's played thirty three tests. Yeah, and you know what I was thinking because I reckon Wade's career is like teetering here a bit, and I mean he's he's probably going to play again, so he's got another chance. Don't get mm. me wrong, but op- he's not a, he's opening the batting in Test cricket. That's fuck. That's so hard mm. for a person who doesn't do that. Well, it's like then head, head, head comes into the calculations because I think but heads, head, they've got they've got tabs on head for tabs, the captain. Yeah. yeah, they've got like he's he I needs run, he needs runs though. Yeah, he? yeah, yeah. He got a hundred last year, didn't he? Mm. He's Southie. I think longer term, it's sort of like well, Green is six and Pekovsky, Willow, well, that's and Willie, the and then they, so because like because now Green's going to play this summer. You know, unless he, Green's going to play the next fifteen summers. Um, well, that's it. But not, once they've made that commitment to him, then that that's that's kind of one spot taken, right? They just love nothing more than those nine overs to rest the quicks, don't they? <laughs> Wade can bowl one forty. <laughs> they try. They try. They, that's true. They tried it with Hilton Cartwright seven years ago, mm. whatever that was. Um, now the SCG uh, test is in jeopardy apparently yeah. because of this COVID situation. But they're just going to move it around, aren't they? So they're talking about it's going to be binned. They're just going to move it in. Like they're going to play the Brisbane. So like for overseas listeners, there's a breakout. There's a cluster happening in uh, Sydney's Northern Beaches at the moment, and. Um, and it's fucking some shit up. So they're going to, they're talking about moving the Brisbane test to be the New Year's test and then Sydney right. in a couple of weeks' time. Yeah, give it not, not to actually possible. bin it completely. Right. Yeah, uh, I think anyway. that's the official line at the moment. They're going to do everything possible to get it at the SCG. They've probably got all sorts of agreements and contracts and stuff. And then, yeah. then you read the tea leaves or read between the lines of the journos who'd be calling and asking these questions on background. Mm. And many of them are saying the preferred option if they can't do Sydney is back to back in Melbourne. It's easier for TV networks. It's um, safer in terms of just staying in a bubble mm. uh, and credit to cricket Australia who like kept all these players in bubbles, even though there appeared to be no COVID in the country uh, on the basis that there might be outbreaks. Mm. And because of that, a lot of them are able to still carry on. Mm. A couple of commentators can't though, like Trent, Copeland won't be able to do the touch screen and mm. that kind of gear. Brett Lee got sent home because he, yeah, lives in, he lives in Northern Beaches. A lot of them are going to commentate like from their studios and stuff in Sydney now as well who went home. So, mm. um, I don't yeah. know. But Warren might be there with his hat. <laughs> exactly. Um, should he should wear a hat, man. I, 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 the only way that Warren's whole iconography would be better if he was bald. And I say that as a bald man, obviously, so I'm biased. Yeah. Imagine someone warns wickets bald. Next level. Why? Just embrace it. Um... Just Is because it? it kind of would have been like, uh, you know, fate, like just telling him, look, you can control so many things, Shane, but you can't control the follicle, you know, yeah. and just roll with it. And but Doug Bollinger was more menacing when he was bald. But isn't Warren's whole thing the show? He's a yeah. peacock. Yeah. He's a peacock. It's the next, every, like fashion needs to evolve, right? And it needs to. Um, yeah, but it's also cyclical. To, that's right. So I'm just saying for the next year or two or whatever, he can be bald. That can be part of his story. Then he can get his hair back. It's all just about having narrative to keep people interested. Mm. And maybe this is part of that. Well, here we are talking about it. So Indeed. job done. Job done, Shane. Hey, uh, Dan Christian scored a 15 ball 50. Yeah. Now it's interesting with Christo because like he, um, he isn't, I, to my knowledge anyway, nowhere near like the conversation about like being in the Australian setup for the T20s. He scores middle order runs. He plays in every T20 competition in the world and dominates it. Does or does very well in it at least, but it just doesn't seem to be in that conversation anymore. Past the age bracket of being in the conversation, I don't know. We spoke to him like two years ago when he was dominating for the Renegades and they went on to win the title, and he was very instrumental to that. I think he was even skippering. He goes around and wins shit, and he was saying that he was it was a major goal for him to be in the Australian T Twenty side for the T Twenty World Cup, which would have been this year. He then had a poor season last year by his own standards. Lost like 14 games in a row, which yeah, I picked right. up <laughs> yeah, to a few teams. Right. That's right, yeah. And I think he dropped off the radar. Yeah. And he's now at the Sixers, which is kind of his home. He's a New yeah. South Welshman. Yeah. And he's doing really well again. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, they prob- it looks like they have moved past him. But yeah. did you notice he's sort of like, he's doing that Maxwell. He's, he seems to be batting like Maxwell now. Mm. I don't know who got there both first eyes, or whatever. But yeah, both eyes of the ball. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Left shoulder out to square leg and just... He- 
hitting in the arc. Mate, I look at like the big bash and like heaps, like, heaps of times when you're watching, well, I'm watching international cricket. I'm like, oh yeah, I can do that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, no, it's what I'm saying is it's just relatable. Yeah. But like some, what the, so the, is, the skills that are happening in the big bash is fucking so foreign to me. It's like, I don't know what Mate, any of this is. Rashid Khan, he's just swept Rashid Khan for seemingly 13 sixes. Yeah. All of them out of the middle. Yeah. Rashid Khan, like he bowls spitting cobras. Yeah. You know, but there's violence on the ball. Yeah. You don't know which way it's going. It's yeah. fucking almost off the wrong foot. And he just whack him for six. It was a great innings as well because the sixes were struggling heading into that, mm. heading into his innings. They were going at five and over. No one could get one off a square. Mm. And uh, then he just comes in, hits 15 or 16, ball 50, seconds it's, faster. It's ever. really funny watching the big bash to me after you've seen the international series. Yeah. Did we say this last time? Yeah. The international series of Australia India where you're just watching that worldies. And then it comes this and it's like, oh, there's like four grade players playing here. And, the, and I can also understand why the fucking pros hate like the clubbies, inverted commas, playing. Yeah in this competition because there is like a sizable gap between the guys who have been like a guy like, again, like Dan Christian, who's yeah. played like in every tournament around the world and wins shit. And then, you know, like a young Jack Edwards or whatever, who obviously yeah. hasn't quite found his feet. He still yeah. is scoring runs, but like you look at the numbers and it's like 17 off 17, mm. 30 off 31. It's like, mm, that's a little mm. bit 1996 for me. I wonder if the, the gap between clubbies and pros in T20 will widen given that there are more specialist T20 players right. now. So that all they do is – Kit around in their life, getting massive, uh, um, you know, strengthening their arms, mm-hmm. chest and biceps, etc., and mm-hmm. hitting big balls. Mm. Good kid. Hey, uh, I don't know if you saw it, but Chris Lynn um, was was mic'd up during a game um, yeah. on air, and he said that he hadn't he hadn't thought about the Bash Bros bonus point when they were <laughs> they're getting absolutely pumped by the stars, and he Mate. got asked about. It, he's like, I haven't thought about it. And you know, can you blame him? I mean, you know, Chris Lynn's the, Chris Lynn <laughs> Linny's the bloke's bloke. You know, like, he, is, he likes he a beer. The, yeah. He just wants to eat a big ball. Yeah. He wants to sit there with Boof, you know, yeah. talking strategy. Just yeah. give it a whack, yeah. you know. They're coming all side, All side mouths. Got Bell's palsy. He's talking. You know, he doesn't want to go for the bash, but he just wants to eat a big ball. <laughs> just <laughs> the heat. Hey, it's hot up here. Yeah. They're not even playing there. Yeah. Uh, you know. Uh, it's in there in Tassie, yeah. Yeah. Just have a Gee, the heat. Gee, the, speaking of, you know, hitting a big ball, mm. the, the heat are a big ball to whack themselves, aren't they? Like, yeah. they're, they're now... I wouldn't say laughing stock, but they've said a lot of people. There was the Ben Cutting rivalry thing the other day as well. He's left and gave yeah, it yeah. to them, and yeah. they were complaining they weren't invited to his wedding or something. It's all happening up in Queensland. Yeah. It's a really good interview with Ben Lachlan we did, though, on Patreon. <laughs> <laughs> um, are, we, are we over the conversation about, like, the rules and how, like, is, is everyone accepting now that, like, everything's exactly the same, except there's just a little bit of interest now in points? I don't know. They're doing the X-Factors now. A couple of teams did the, uh, the X-Factor sub, subbed a couple of players out. Johan Boyter was one of the players who was subbed in. Hey, I, yeah, like I'm not chaining myself to the proverbial tr- you know, Twitter tree in protest mm. at the egregious like, uh, you know, assault on the integrity of the T tw- of the BBL. <laughs> yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. I, like, like we've said, yeah. it's color v color. It's a little conversation there. There can still be close games. I know it annoys the players because they just want to keep consistency of rules, and that's fine. The game's not for them. Sorry, guys. It's also not for us. It's yeah. for kids, mm. and uh, and and it's still pretty enjoyable. I don't I don't think the rules are so intrusive mm. as to annoy. I agree, I, and and I can also understand that people say, but they're gimmicky. It's like yes, they are gimmicky. Like, T twenty is a gimmick. T twenty. B- the BBL they, is they, literally designed as a gimmick, as a gateway, like sugar hit piece of junk to get you involved in the game down the track. Like, when was it ever not a gimmick? And the same people who are trying to protect the integrity of the game are probably the same people who opposed it coming in to begin with. It's just many people are just just want to show themselves as purists. I don't mind the rules. Here's, here's what happens in the big bash. They do a bat flip for the coin toss. Um, they then, the ball gets arrived to the bowler for the first ball on a drone. Yep. The players are mic'd up. There's a fucking camera, like, on the pitch, basically. Um, yeah, there's rule changes and stuff. It's all a fucking gimmick. Yeah. When someone hits a single or square leg, there's crowd noise clapping. Yeah, well, I don't like that. That's and I don't just, like that either. <laughs> there's, but there's, there's heaps of things which are just like, this is just, a, they're trying to add yeah. bells and whistles to a yeah. TV show. All, yeah, it's there all seems to be a lot of people clapping when they just sort of scamper around to, to 45. It's pretty funny. Uh, yeah. It's pretty funny. What what game was it? Was it the Sixers game? Yeah, it was a Sixers game. That Wait, who who, who did they play against? They who win? knows, mate? It doesn't matter. One of the, one of the teams. Anyway, and the team, the team chasing weren't bowled out. They were, but they needed like 40 off the last over. And then it was like, they needed 25 off the last ball. <laughs> hit, a, hit a single square leg. Woo! Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes the same button. The clap begins before you know if they've made their ground as well. <laughs> hey, T, you know, you know how it is. He goes, I mean, we've got, you're like, yeah. T, T, if you're an adult, if you're 35 or whatever, you watch the tests. Mm. 
you have a couple of beers and you roll in, just like Blobby. Right now. There you know? Oh my God. <laughs> you roll in. You, the colours are playing the colours. Someone's hitting a big ball, hopefully. Someone's been funny in the commentary, you know. Mate, it's pretty funny in the commentary. It's like, it's, you know, I've said this before, but you know how sport is kind of... The, the test match is fine because it's crowded the test match so far, but like... The sport is highlighting how fucked the world is at the moment when there's like when there's no crowds there, it's all a bit fabricated. Yeah, and yeah. even the commentators aren't in the bubble at the moment for the big bash. So like they're watching the feed and they don't know where the fielders are. So someone will hit a ball to the outfield and they'll be like and uh, and Christian goes big into the outfield to the man. No, there's no man there. Four <laughs> runs shot from Dan Christian. It's like it's fucking weird. It's like listening to Tony Gregg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. RIP respect. Of course, respect. Okay. Chris. Respect. Um, okay, once again, we've spoken for far too long. But uh, well, last week uh, I wanted to speak about uh, South Africa and the England series. England uh, skipped out of town pretty quick when there's a bit of COVID knocking them back. So they've got India. They've got an Indian tour coming up, which might be a little bit more De Niro yeah. in the pocket, if you know. You so. will. Yeah. And uh, but they're going, to, they're going to Sri Lanka first. And they've just uh, they've just acquired Jacques Callas mm. uh, into the. He's going to be their batting consultant. Yeah. Um, and uh, Barney Rani actually made a very good point on Twitter uh, last night that um, whilst you might consider Asia as a whole. Uh, he only played a couple of test matches in Sri Lanka, actually, and he averaged less than 20 in that place. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the name Jacques Callas, just that's safety. You got Jacques Callas, so England has just fallen a little bit of path there, a little bit of path towards some safety. Are you, you going to like deny Jacques Callas coaching, you know, your players? Wouldn't have thought so. Imagine imagine Callas and Bairstow together. There's a circuit. We just love it, don't we? Like, we just transpose the. Um the thing that the player achieved when they were doing it physically, like um, mm. like if you held a bat well and you could hit runs, mm. you could be a good commentator, you know. <laughs> or like, yeah, and yeah, it's the yeah, same yeah. with coaching. Now, of yeah. course, you could probably transfer. You're a freak. You want to coach? transfer your knowledge to coaching easier than commentary, but but like both are yeah. specific skills as well that bring right. their own levels of knowledge. So, yeah. but what I want to say is what you're saying, you know. I have no idea what sort of skills Jacques Callis brings as a coach. No. I don't know about his communication. Yeah. I don't know about his ability to educate. I don't know about his insights into the technical, uh, you know, elements of batting at that level. Some mm. guys are just good. Hell of a um, chest. But fuck, yeah, have a go at the rig. You know, like, <laughs> and how thick is his face? Have a go at it. May have a go at how th the thickness of the thing. Yeah, you it's, know? A, it's a thick thing. And a it's, thick it's thing. a balcony selection. You see Jax yeah. Callis in England kit with his fucking speed dealers on. Yeah, three I don't know, lines. He's probably got a wide brim on. Yeah. His arms are still bigger than everyone's arms, probably bigger than his head. Mm. Oh, that's runs, yeah. as far as I'm concerned, and safety. Oh, there you go. England again, back in Shalaka, 3-0. Hey, uh, just real quickly, um, before we head to Michael Bevan, who's on the show, yeah. uh, New Zealand absolutely smashed the West Indies last week. Um, they're now into the Pakistan series. They won the first T20 yesterday by nine wickets, chasing about 181, I want to say. Yep. Um, but what's very interesting about New Zealand, I didn't realise this, but like New Zealand, any idea how many tests New Zealand's have lost at home in the last 10 years? No. Five. They've lost five tests. How many have they played? In t <laughs> seven. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years, they've lost yeah. five tests. Yeah, yeah, okay, they haven't played the same amount as Australia, but that, that's fucking, that's an amazing record. What I'm saying is they're good at home. Yeah. Now, what's interesting about this is we put this in the context of the uh, uh, the World Championship final thing that they do. Yeah. yeah. That they do now. Uh, Australia's basically already in it, uh, in that final at Lords next year. Oh, yeah. um, they'll play that. They'll definitely play that. Yeah. Sponsored by Pfizer or Moderna. And uh, India are coming second at the moment, but India will need to win four of their last eight tests to make the Test Championship final, which puts into context a little bit. If India are gone here in this series, now they'll probably, they'll probably win now in Boxing Day. Mm. But like if India are gone, they're going to have to win four of their last four matches to make that final, given that uh, that's also if New Zealand sweep Pakistan, which, let's be honest, they're probably going to. Is that in New Zealand? That's in New Zealand. Yeah, right. So there's just some stuff there. Isn't it interesting? Yeah. Well... <laughs> I don't know, is it? <laughs> Maybe. Well, uh, is Australia there? Oh, good. But people have said in the past that, like, for the Test Championship to have, like, to be valid, that India need to win the first one, so then there's more money going <laughs> to the stuff. <laughs> well, notice, like, Kane Williamson, uh, he scored all his runs and he had a kid, yeah. uh, and he's come back into the T20 setup after a week off and scored even more runs. It was 80 or 40 or something like that, some some incredible knock. You always play better after you have a kid because you have yeah. perspective. So yeah. Coley will score some runs. Yeah. Okay. Um, all yeah. things going well. Yeah. So, um. India may still be. I think India need to be there. So BCCI needs to do, just move forward a series with Ireland or something like so that. If, so because India, their home summer, they play against England after England go to Sri Lanka. So okay. England will – Is they Callis sweep, going to that? It, <laughs> <laughs> if Callis is going, then India's in trouble. Just for the camera shots. 
It's a great point. <laughs> Even though he would probably have a 16 over there, like yeah. everyone else. Yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> Took no wickets. Um, Pez, Michael Bevan is on the show. Incredible. And who brings this to us? Well, need I say it? Yes, contractually. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> the interview's brought to you by Ponting Wines, uh, where you can get 10% off. A case of the ba- of those bad boys using the code get a few. Uh what can I say? You've got you've got three bottles sitting in your yeah, uh, well, in your I, kitchen. I, you I, had one? I I had more than that, mate. I had a couple. Oh, did you? Yeah. Did you buy some more or something? No, no, no. Or they I, gave was, you? I, I was sent some very kindly from yeah. the from the actually Ricky brought them over. But you seem to have three left over. Three reds left over. You had a few whites, did you? Yeah, I had a couple yeah. of whites. A couple of whites. Had the boy red. out of Sydney, yeah. Yeah. Um, very nice. Yeah. Very nice. The Shiraz is what everyone's talking about. No, I haven't had the Shiraz yet. Yeah. I had the Cab Save yeah. and a couple Cab of Shiraz. Hey, hey, Cab Save's nice. Yeah. Ricky couldn't stay when he brought him over. Mm. Uh, he just dropped him off. Um, I actually didn't see him, but I just presume it was him. Yeah. Right, is that so. what? Is that like the time we interviewed him? He said, can I call you Rick? And he basically said, no. No. Yeah. No, no not really. Apparently, no. apparently I'll do. Yeah. And then we started yeah. talking about his social media and he said, you got a blue tick. And he goes, do I? <laughs> <laughs> You've got AO after your name, do I? <laughs> Use the code get a few, 10% off. That's pontywines.com.au. Here's Michael Bevan. Okay, here goes. We're talking to a hero of ours mm. today. Here's some numbers, as is our want. Uh, he represented his country 250 times, 18 times at test level, 232 times in ODIs. He averaged 53 for Australia in coloured clothing, six tonnes, 46 fifties, two World Cups to his name. He made nearly 20,000 first-class runs at 57 with 68 tonnes and 81 fifties. Mm. There's 120 first-class wickets to his name too. He was regularly dubbed the world's best limited overs batsman. Some would say remains that as well, and uh, it is a complete pleasure as a result of all of that to welcome Michael Bevan to the Grey Cricketer Podcast. Bevo, hello. Thanks, guys. Much appreciated, and also for reading out the bio that I provided for you. <laughs> <laughs> Much a like, little bit younger than you, but uh, you were a you know a, a prodigal superstar. You know, I, I remember my um, you know my dad being excited about you coming through the ranks. I still remember pictures of you batting without a lid. Uh, guys are just starting to do that now. Uh, did you you know you you were at the academy? Um, did you did you skip? Uh, grade cricket altogether, or do you come through those ranks as well? Oh, I don't know. I'm not sure if I was that good. Uh, I, I, I. Well, look. I mean, I went through the, um, you know, all the underage uh, representative teams, and I'm originally from Canberra or ACT, and so that's that's the way I sort of forged my way into the the, the cr- cricket academy in a, in Adelaide and obviously Australian under 19s and I probably came to prominence um, in those teams and carnivals playing for the ACT so it was a bit of a strange one obviously Canberra doesn't have the, the greatest pedigree uh, cricketing pedigree in Australia and it's a smallish place but uh, you know, I set my stall and wanted to sort of make a name for myself in the cricketing world, um, regardless of, of where I was from. So, um, yeah, I was pretty fortunate, I guess. Mm. That, you, that wouldn't have left you a lot of time to play um, to play grade cricket, but did you know? Did that form of the game teach you anything, even if just off the field and in the tubs? Oh well, of course. I mean, you know, grade cricket is where. It, all happened, and for me in Canberra, it was was first grade, uh, then then Adelaide, then then Sydney. So, and I, I think one of the things that that I was fortunate to experience, and I, I don't know for whatever reason it changed at some point in time, but look, there was a tremendous amount of experience running through grade cricket, and quite often older players played, you know, thirty five, forty, and and and. And they really enjoyed that aspect, and and they passed across a lot of information and made the experience, um, you know, a, a, a really a really enjoyable experience for a young player trying to ply his trade. And so, I don't think that happens much nowadays. I think it's it's a it's a lot younger for some reasons, and obviously, you know, family commitments. Not a lot of the older senior players hang around that long. Mm. 
Mm. You obviously stayed true to that mantra because in 2016, Bevo, you, you played a, a fourth grade game for East against Ramick Petersham at Trump or Oval, I think it was. Um, you know, what, what's, what sort of things were you passing on to the youngsters there? Maybe a pair of gloves or, you know, show me baggy green. Or, I mean, also, how, how'd you go in that game in that fourth grade game? Well, probably how to injure three body parts within 20 <laughs> seconds, I reckon. Um, that they were my memory for, for that match. It was crazy. It wasn't one of the best decisions that I'd made in my career, either as a coach or as a player. And I look, honestly, I as, as coach of Eastern Suburbs Cricket Club, mm. uh, we were really struggling for num- numbers. And for memory, fours were a chance of making the finals. And it was really the only option we had available to us. And so I kind of recall getting in the net for two weeks prior, trying to find some cricket equipment, uh, jumping into the match, um, scoring 25 off about 75 balls, uh, getting sledged the crap out of by all these young players, um, injuring myself. I, look, I've still got tennis elbow from that day. Uh, <laughs> but, but I put the groin and did a back muscle within the first 20 seconds. So there's no... I, 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 from memory, I think we just won the match. That's the only overriding memory I have mm. of, of playing uh, cricket after my retirement. Now, I don't do it not, uh, much nowadays because my body's not in great shape. So <laughs> that, I can carry categorically say that will be that would have been the, the last game of cricket I ever played. I mean East have always been able to get the bed, the big players when they needed to, you know, for a for a fourth grade game. Oh, do you remember what, what sort of sledges you were copying? Yeah. Oh I, I was look I, I, I don't but um, it's safe to say that my short ball dramas continued to that day. <laughs> uh, and <laughs> and 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 that wasn't my worst memory. My worst memory was trying to actually field and run in the field. And I remember sitting at slips, thinking, "I just I hope the ball doesn't come to me." And <laughs> when we bowled poorly enough that I actually had to come out of the slips, it was it was all pretty ugly, really. <laughs> Uh, let's, but, but thankfully you had a, uh, a very fruitful career mm. before that. Uh, there's a great piece that's just come out, uh, Bevo by Dan Bredigan, Crick Info, uh, Crick Info Monthly, I think. And it's an interview he did with Phil Emery, mm. uh, who played, uh, played a test for Australia in Pakistan. And he's obviously an old teammate of yours as well. And he describes in great detail just how well you batted in Pakistan in 1994 uh, against an attack with Wazim and Wakar reversing the ball, uh, presumably Suklain and Mushtaq as well. And you made a few 80s there. Uh, but unfortunately, it wasn't on TV. And Phil Emery makes the point. I'm not sure if you've seen the piece, but he says, "Yeah, I think if everybody saw that uh, those innings, that they would feel very differently about Michael Bevan." I mean, I suppose. What are your reflections of that particular um, tour? Uh, and and do you think Phil's right? Uh, no, I don't think he's quite right uh, because ultimately, cricket um, at that level and most levels is about performance and. Um, whilst you know, I, I was uh, I was unsure of how people perceived how I batted in that series. As you quite rightly said, it was my first uh, Test series against uh, the world's best bowling attack, and I think I averaged about sixty in that series. Um, and 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 if I was really honest, it 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 wasn't a tough it it, it wasn't a tough um, initiation for me into test cricket. It was sort of I went into it with my eyes wide open, um, a very and put very little pressure on myself, and ended up sort of topping the average for the Australian batsman. And look, it did. Like I don't know how he how he saw it, but for me, it, it, it felt reasonably easy against high quality bowlers. Um, and Look, so that was one of my recollections. The other one of my recollections was in the second test where the, the, we played on a green top and I was sort of following uh, Steve War, who had his own short ball problems at that point in time and really watching Akram uh, giving him a pu- pummeling in terms of short ball bowling and I was kind of thinking, wow, this is test cricket. And uh, 
I was kind of amazed at the intensity of it all. But no, look, I, I mean, look, look, I've been described as an enigma, a tortured genius. People can't work out why I perform so well in one day cricket, not test cricket. Uh, why I perform well at first class cricket, not test cricket. And it was, I suppose it was my own personal demons and all the good work that I did in my first test series, you know, became undone in my second test series against England in Australia, against an inferior bowling attack. And it really wasn't apparent, you know, I think I averaged about 10 or 15 or something like that. So I, I kind of really wasn't apparent to me why that happened at the time. And uh, so whilst Phil has a point, I don't think it would have mattered because for whatever reason during that series, I was in no way, shape or form ready to go to, to, to perform, you know, to the level that I've, I, I I hoped I could have achieved. Mm. In that um in that same article, um, Phil's saying there that you you two were batting in an ODI game, I think it was against Wazim and Wakar, and Emery couldn't he couldn't hit the ball like he he knew which way it was swinging, but he couldn't hit it. So you you suggested that um you try and miss the ball by a foot, um which is what you were doing apparently. Um and <laughs> and and he seemed to go okay after that. Um and also I mean to to, to ask that question. Another way, I mean, why do you think Pakistan were able to swing it so much? <laughs> um, yeah, I just think that, um, well, just on the first question, which mm. is obviously by far easier to answer. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and the great thing about being an ex-cricketer, by the way, is that you can just uh, embellish these stories to the nth degree, mm. and it's... And, and it's great, but look, and 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 one of my overriding memories because I mean I I played a few one day games for Australia, but mm, usually one day cricket that I'd watched on TV was you know the last ten overs of the one day game. You know everyone just had a bit of a tonk, slogged it, and tried to smash it. And here we were faced with this situation where we we're facing Wasm and Wackar in the last ten overs, and they were swinging it at reverse right angles um, <laughs> honing in on the base of those stumps and it was kind of near impossible to play. So, um, yeah, he was right in that aspect. It was pretty tough. In terms of how Pakistanis did it, I'm not too sure, but look, it, it'd be, it's, it's, I suppose it's not fair for me to sort of say that when we played, there weren't things that happened in the game mm. uh, that where, where we weren't trying to get the ball to go reverse, you know, in terms of, Sort of uh, eating mints or, mm. or, or or putting sunscreen on the ball, and I'm not saying it's right that those things sort of tended to happen or had less priority back in those days, and yeah. so it'd sort of be hypocritical for me not to say that it it, it didn't happen on some level, mm. maybe not to the degree of uh, the sandpaper, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, but mm. um, look, within the the cricket fraternity, those things look have happened in the past. And, and obviously more recently yeah. as well. Yeah. Oh, I'm surprised. I thought Australia were just the good guys, you know, uh, and, and it was just all the other guys who were the baddies. Um, if I, if we could just labour just a little bit, Bev, I'm conscious that we've started by talking about, uh, you know, you, you mentioning your tortured genius and all that kind of stuff because mm. you, you still had a wonderful career that many people remember uh, and, and Lord, rightly so. Um, you are a guy, I think, in a parallel universe could have played 150 tests. Like, Do, do you find, in, in the context of uh, what's happening in Australian cricket at the moment, do you find it tough watching the number of opportunities many guys get today as as batters? And and what do you think of the standard of Australian batting today as compared to your era? Look, well, I'm not a big watcher of the game. I've started more recently, and I follow it from afar, or I follow a big series, and so I've I watched the first test uh, in Adelaide, um, yeah. and you know that happens from series to series for me. So it's it's. Uh, you know, it's not a big focus for me, but what, one, one thing that I would currently say, one about the team in general, is that, 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 that under Justin, look, there's been a sort of a market improvement in the, the rankings um, and where, where they sit um, and the standard of cricket they're playing. Um, in terms of batsmen, uh, look, I, I, in my day, look, if you didn't average 50 in, in first-class cricket, you were no chance of playing test cricket for Australia. And so, uh, look, it, it even got to the point where 
some years I was averaging 60 or 70 um, in first-class cricket, and I still probably didn't get a look in. Uh, so I suppose maybe different standards for different eras. You can only really go on this era, and um, you know, players generally tend to deserve to be selected when you know they they're at the pinnacle of of what they do in the first class game and and look I, I'm not too sure the number of chances they receive should should come into it too often but if, if a player has received a couple of opportunities and their their, their, their performances are sli- similar to other guys that haven't received one then obviously you're going to have to trial trial new players etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, yeah look during my period we had such a great great team that it was it, it Look, we had to strive so hard to get in the team and so hard to stay in the team. Mm. You may being a bit coy there, Bevo, about like, you know, some years you average 60 or 70 because one year you averaged 97, um, which was 2004-05. You hit the most runs in a Shield season ever with 1,464. That was in nine matches. You hit eight centuries, as I said, at 97. I'm just telling you things you already know. Um, I mean, that was after that was after Trevor Hons uh, said that your performances for Australia had significantly decreased in the, in the one-day format. Um, and you scored that many runs at the age of 34. I just found it interesting then because, you know, thinking about Adam Voges scoring all his runs he did at 36, I think it was. I mean, Ed Cowan probably had his best ever season, his final year for New South Wales before he lost his uh, contract. I mean, do you think that sometimes we're, we're too quick to write off batsmen for being maybe too old when the perception is that their best batting years are behind them? Oh, potentially. I mean, I have to take Trevor Holmes. Uh, a statement, uh, you know, you, I would, wouldn't take it state, uh, at face value. Um, mm. I think there were a, had my, my, during my time, there were a lot of good younger players or players that were probably looking to, you know, potentially was surpassing my performances. I don't think my performance hadn't really decreased at all. But you know, there were guys like Michael Clark, Andrew Simons, and 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 of course Mike Huffey that were. Mm. You know, very close to being selected, and I think that you know, basically, I think the Australians' top order was just so good that my role diminished. I don't think my performances just diminished. So, um, I think that was probably my overriding memory of that period. Um, and as you mentioned, the two thousand and four season for me was 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 pretty strong. And um, and <laughs> and, and was, most were after ninety seven. So I think I improved as a player after that time, but never really got the opportunity. And I'm not really um, sour or bitter about it. it you know, it's it's it just the way it was, and didn't pan out the way I thought it would. But in the end, I, I did most of my learning and improving after the age of twenty seven, um, where I didn't really get another. Too many more opportunities to play for Australia, but that's okay. Mm. That's just, fine. Just averaging ninety-seven point <laughs> six zero over a, a pretty extended period of time, like a whole Shield season. You know, like you just got a chance to feel how Bradman must have felt all the time batting. Like, was it <laughs> Bradman must have had a bit of fun? Hey, well, that's true. It's it's, it's an easier game when you're scoring runs, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, it's 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 so much more enjoyable, and um, I, I think. You know the really enjoyable parts of the innings is when you sort of can let go later, later towards the back end of the the, the innings and take on a few bowlers, and um, those periods are always nice for sure. Mm. In the, um, it, you, you mentioned a couple of times about that sort of uh, weakness against the short ball, which I, which I wonder might have been a bit of a myth as your career went on. Let me read an excerpt here from an article written by Adam Burnett of cricket.com.au. Uh, Michael Duvernodo and his Tasmania teammate Michael Bevan were entrenched in what would become a 277-run stand against New South Wales at Bell Reeve at the back end of the 2004-05 Sheffield Shield summer. And Bevan was in spectacular form. Against the Blues attack featuring five test bowlers, he had cruised to his seventh century of the Shield season, equaling a record he would break a week later. They bowled another short one to him, and he hit it to the fence for four again, Divinito says. We met mid-wicket, and he looked at me, shaking his head, and said something like, what are they thinking bowling there to the Bevster? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> how much fun did you have this season? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, look, it, it, it was, a, it, it, it was a, a, a ball or a shot that, for me, that sort of meant different things and mm. whole different perceptions 
in test cricket as opposed to first class cricket. I, I look, you know, first class cricket, which a lot of people don't realise. I mean, they have actually short balls in first class cricket, and you're allowed to bowl a couple of those and over as well. And so, yet yeah, my 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 performances in first class cricket were, you know, pretty solid. And um, and and so it it was a weird thing for me. It, it just it happened in a time where I was new to the Australian team, and I guess you could sort of, I guess you could categorise it as similar to like a golfer getting the yips. Maybe it sort of happened in mm. Test cricket for me, and I made too much of an issue of it. It was never really an issue, but then I never really got over it either. So it it, it was something that it, mm. that it affected me throughout my my career. Yeah, mm. you're obviously such a skilled limited overs player. Bevo and, and so many of us, particularly our age, have such great memories of you just finishing off innings, just always finishing with a great number of runs, managing to do it with such uh, skill and subtlety. Uh, you know, what was your secret to middle, like I guess, middle order batting back then in ODI cricket? And I, I note that the Aussie team at the moment have se- seemed to be struggling for middle order batting in that short mm. form of the game. And uh, is there anything you notice within their middle order batting that, you think they need to look at or at least use you as an imprint of? For me, um, look, everyone's got a different approach. Um, so it's, 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 it would, I would, I don't think it would be ideal for me to turn around and say you need to do it this way or you need to do it that way. I think every player has a different set of skills, a different set of approach uh, and different game plans. And, and, and their challenges was no different to my challenge in the sense that, you're trying to be consistent in what you do, um, and and that's the challenge for everyone. But a couple of concepts that you know you need, you know that that, that apply, I guess, to everyone is having um, one the right game plan for for any different situation that crops up in in, in the one day game. And you know sometimes you you need to understand when to put foot down. Um, on the accelerate, sometimes you need to understand when to take it off. And I think that's the real, real skill that when you look at guys like probably Virat, when I've just noticed Virat playing lately, I mean, he has the ability to, to, to morph or click from one, one speed to the next. And that's really a, um, that, that's really about game plans and, and, and having the right plan for every situation and sort of managing risk. So I guess a feature of, my game and the reason why my average was as high as it was is that I kind of, you know, I played the probabilities and tried to minimise risk. And so for any given situation and for uh, any given bowler, I would really only have one four shot. And so I would sort of say to myself, right, well, given the conditions, given the bowler, given the match situation, this is my best chance of scoring four and the highest probability of me scoring four. And I would really stick to that shot. So I wouldn't have, I wouldn't clutter my mind with multiple shots and wonder mm. what do I need to play or, mm. you, know, you know, where do I need to hit it? I would just have one shot. And then whenever it fell in my zone, I would hit it. And then uh, any, any time it was outside my zone, I'd just really try and work for a single, so it kind of meant that my strike rate wasn't quite as high as some other people uh, or other batsmen. But it also meant that I that I really managed my risks and my game plans were were pretty much spot on for every every situation of the game. I guess. Mm. But you were responsible for probably the greatest moment of my cricketing life um, when you hit Roger life. Harper for four at the SCG on New Year's Day, 1996. So I want to say um, thank you for that. Thank you for that wonderful moment that you gave to me and the nation. Um, do, you, do, you feel like, do you feel like that moment changed your life? Oh, definitely. Um, definitely. And it's, it's what I've become known for. And, and as you said, it is a memory that will mm. stay with a, with a lot of people for a, for a long time. And so, I, you know, I, and I guess, I guess I I was very blinkered in the lead up to that match. I just got selected from back playing for Australia for that series, and mm. you know it all happened. And 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 I for me it was just something that I did. I I didn't I wasn't you know it wasn't anything special. Mm. 
um, it was kind of how I played. And, and so I was really unaware of what it meant to people probably until the next day because um, I'd never really experienced being like a, well, I don't know, it's the right word, a, a true, true, true celebrity or being famous. And it wasn't until the next day where I was just walking down the street and people were shouting across the street, hey, Bebo, you're a legend, this and that. And then, you know, and, and it was really quite, off, well, it was quite bizarre, a bit off-putting and a bit frenzied. And it sort of, it, but it did make me understand and realise the impact that um, that match had had on people who were who were watching it, and so um, you, you know, and even nowadays, I, I you know, I move on quickly, and 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 well, you know, and it has been a while, but at times when you're talking to people about their experience of that match and their mm. experience of my career, it it, it, it kind of. Look, I guess it, it makes you feel pretty proud of what you've done and achieved, and um, at least I can say that to some degree I've, I've I've played a part in Australian cricket, hopefully for the better. Mm. My dad actually took me to that game, Bevo, and then took me home because it started raining half of the day, <laughs> and, and then said, uh, and, "Yeah." And yeah. and seriously, that's what happened. It yeah. like everyone, like it, it started raining. We were getting our butts kicked. Yep. Um, no one believed that we could win the match. I didn't believe we could win the match, um, and <laughs> and 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 everyone went home. So I reckon half the crowd went home. Yeah. Um, oh. And so, and I'm sure everyone watching on TV, half the people were probably pissed. So I, I, I I'm not sure the real recollections of everybody uh, everybody during that during that match. Well, then, even when we got home, it, it came back on. He said, "No, it's it's past your bedtime, and they're going to lose anyway." So. <laughs> I still remember walking into his room afterwards and he's like, no, they won, so that was good. Yeah. Um, I, I just noticed you mentioned this earlier, Bevo, you said you haven't been much of a cricket watcher. You actually said that in 2018 as well, saying you, you haven't watched much cricket now that you've finished and that you've moved on. Uh, I, I noticed you're on Instagram now. It's Bevo underscore Michael Bevan and good content too, good uh, comments under stuff as well. Yeah. I like following them. Um, I just want to know, like, what – why didn't you watch much after you finished uh, and where are you at with uh, cricket now? Well, it, I kind of get absorbed in whatever I'm doing at that point in time. So for cricket, for me, once I'd sort of, and I'm a bit of a goal-orientated person, I think, and 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 I, I, I and as soon as those goals or those things disappeared, I, like I'm not the cricketer that's, that's in it for the social reasons or... Uh, I'm not the cricketer that's in it to, for the ego or the confidence, and so it was quite, quite, you know, quite strange. And once I finished, I, I sort of I moved on very quickly and just sort of found other things that I wanted to do. And that's not to say that I haven't slipped back into either the coach, you know, into watching cricket, but from a coaching perspective for some of the teams that I've that I've coached um, and. Uh, so it, it really just depends um, what I'm doing at any given time. I suppose one of the one of the reasons why I have sort of moved back into watching cricket and in fact into social media is that I'm probably you know I feel as though I need to for a couple of reasons. One of them is I'll, you know I'll be shortly launching an online batting mentoring service, um, and I'd like people to know about that. And, you know, that kind of goes with the territory in terms of social media um, and, and, and being on that. And so, but I also, you know, just just on my comments in Instagram, I, I look, I also think the main thing about being on social media for me as an ex-cricketer is probably to offer, offer opinions or interesting pieces or things that people will follow. Mm. Um and so that's pretty important to me. So even though that you know I will will be providing people sort of details of what I'm what I'm doing, um, I, first and foremost, I think there has to be sort of an interaction there between you know fan and ex player, and then whatever happens after that is, is, is as long as everyone's sort of sort of getting something out of it, then that's the main thing I think. Mm. We'll make sure we chuck that Instagram uh, handle in our show notes, Bevo. Bevo underscore Michael Bevan. It's good. It's good Insta content. Uh, 
Just finally, you've been so good with your time, Bevo. I just noticed as we were preparing for this interview that uh, many years ago, Brad Hogg alleged that you literally sleep with your eyes open. So can you just <laughs> clarify that before we wrap up the interview? Do you sleep with your eyes open? Well, I've got to, I've got to, I've got to thank you guys for not bringing up all these Bevo stories because there's plenty out there. Um, and you've only brought up, I reckon, one of them, which is this, this one. And um, look, I had, like, I was never a great sleeper. I was always a bit wide, a bit analytical. I had a lot of things going through my mind. So never a great sleeper. So I reckon, look, I reckon there were a lot of times that my roommate during the early years, um, would probably, I don't know, wake up snoring or or, or, or or for whatever reason and find <laughs> find that I was probably sitting at the side of my bed staring at them. Um, and uh, it, it it kind of would have been really off-putting, I guess. So, yeah, yeah look, I'm not sure that I – it wasn't so much that I slept with my eyes open. It was probably just that I didn't sleep. <laughs> Well, Bevo. Um, while we're on it, while, while, whilst whilst we're in the area, uh, I think I asked this to you before when we, when we met a couple of years ago. But um, Michael Slater at the time was commentating. I think for Channel Nine, it must have been. Um, was it anyway? Anyway, whoever it was said that um, when you got out, once you uh, literally went straight into the shower in full kit um, and just put the shower on, because you were so disgusted with getting out. Um, so my question is, uh, what was the water temperature? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I look, I, 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 I don't know. I kind of dispute that one. Um, okay. but uh, look, so, well, not, no, look, I believe it happened, but I don't know if it was the full gift, probably with clothes on. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So that, that was probably a solid chance of happening. <laughs> um, and it was, a, and it was a very, it was a very amateur game. So I'm not sure they provided us hot water back in those days. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but, I, but I can also remember about getting out because I was an extremely frustrated guy when I didn't perform. And mm. but yeah, look, I can you can add another story, which was like I, I remember going out bowling in the nets for for about an hour after I got um, after I got out just to let off some steam and frustration. But um, yeah, there, there's a, there's a lot of stories out there, and look, more than happy to share a couple with you guys. So thanks for asking and bring it up. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can feel the sincerity in that. Bevo. We, were, we were trying to be polite. But I feel like you opened the door, <laughs> um, so, mate. Thanks, thanks so much for your time. Uh, we'll put that Insta handle in our show notes. Like I said, Bevo, all the best with uh, what you're doing in the future with uh, your online mentoring service, and uh, I, I guess people can find you there. Thanks for all the memories as well, mate. It's a pleasure, and uh, thanks for the thanks for having me, guys. Much appreciated. Here goes season's greetings to you and yours. To you and yours. Yeah, yours, your partner. Yeah, you don't own them, though. I'm speaking about just speaking globally. We don't want to go public with your scenario. <coughs> My scenario. Um, and season's greetings, and a bit of a different twist on it this time to Budgie Smuggler, who have been. I just. I, I don't want to go into the whole which design do you want to use on their wonderful uh, set of apparel, whichever mm-hmm. you want, mm-hmm. though you can do that. Mm-hmm. I just want to say thanks to Budgie Smuggler. That's nice. Uh, who have been instrumental in supporting this podcast. No Budgie Smuggler, no podcast, or at least to this level, I would say. Uh, they have got behind us, around us, in and around us, mm-hmm. uh, pretty much from the start, but especially, yeah. but especially lately. Uh, they've brought you this podcast all season and into the UK season and stuff as well. An excellent business. I keep seeing them around everywhere. I think Jack Edwards' pants came down during the uh, T20. Mm. What was he wearing? Budgie smugglers. Mm. I noticed Jason Richardson on Channel 7 said he's got his budgie smugglers on there. I thought, what a smart business, just literally naming it after the um, garment itself. Yeah. Might start a, a, a company called Underwear. You yeah, know what okay. I mean? Yep. He's got his underwear on there. Yeah. But smart business, doing very well. Yeah. Uh, and It's something like Kleenex. Hoover, yeah, it's like it's naming the like it's become like well. a, it's become the uh, description of the item itself. Good people who've backed us for a long time, Australian owned, Australian made as well. I mean, hopefully that protects them against the uh, the growing China trade war mm. that's going on. Mm. But I think we'll all be caught up in that in some way or other. Oh, in some way, yeah. Uh, but I just want to take you know in this season's greetings mm. uh, spirit, just the opportunity to say thank you and to send my season's greetings to Budgie Smuggler, who no doubt don't listen to this. If they did, they'd count us a long time ago. Would have thought so. Quite yeah. a long time ago. But if you are cheerio to the people at Budgie Smuggler, get around them. 
Uh, and yeah, you can you can also use the code CHAMP for free shipping for their stuff as well. And you know what they have because we mention it every single week. Budgetsmuggle.com.au. Hashtag I said you see, Pezzy Lad. Yep. Uh, anything else to add before? This is the final show before Christmas 2020. Mm-hmm. We'll do another show next week, of course. Of course. Of course. Won't be the last one this year. Um, but I don't have anything to add. I've got nothing written down. Nothing really? off the top of my head. Just Christmas and that. Just couldn't be giving more seasons greetings. It's I've got to tell you, man, it's nice to have the cricket back. You know, and it's like it's back now, the tests are back. Yeah. There's something to talk about. There's some normality there. Australia's bowling some stuff. I hadn't realised that emotionally the summer hadn't begun for me until they were playing in white think, clothes. I don't think it – yeah, I agree. I think it used to when we – like we're actually playing when we were younger maybe because yeah. you start the season like in October then. Yeah. And your pre-season stuff and end of footy season kind of tips over into the mm. same. And La Nina means that like there haven't been as many fires around as well, which is another note. Quite of, off another, Quite Well, off I wouldn't say that's the start of summer because they sort of started around October last year. So that's more of a you know sign of spring. Did you catch the Great Conjunction last night? I didn't. No. No. Do you know what that is? No. Uh, it's where um, it's Saturn and Jupiter were were seen like next to each other, and basically oh. it's first time in tw- it happens every twenty years, but. Right. The, it's been 400 years since they've been this close. They've lined up. And 800 years since the entire world could see it, basically at the same time. Uh-huh. Yeah. <coughs> Jacob Woodhouse rots in. <laughs> the first two rounds of the grey cricket season have seen myself circuit twice, but not for my own personal glory. In round one of my best mates... In round one, one of my best mates went and hit probably the best hundred I have ever seen and smashed, as I quote Cameron, the leading wicket taker in the Sheffield Shield, also in my pocket, Gannon, to all parts of the ground. As I wasn't picked, I got to watch this and was told by many of the playing members, make sure he doesn't die tonight. <laughs> so, so he was more excited about what was going to happen that night. He didn't really care about his career saving ton, which will see him play ones for the next 10 years. We circuited but I did it better as I got the chop. We circled it, but I did it better as I got the chop. So technically, did I have the better day? Mm. Come to round two, and my other best mate goes and scores a chanceless 100 on the whacker. My fucking dream. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to see this one as I was picked in the threes with a good bunch of blokes, but, but fuck, we suck. <laughs> However, this game was live stream, so of course my mate decides to put it on the laptop at pre's. Yeah, mate, we get it. Wrap it up, champ. He also goes on to mention about 300 times that night in the clubs at this stage both my both mates are classing themselves in the elusive have made a first grade ton group which left me on the outer for the entire night and a perfect chance to get some fucking birding done which was also successful as i actually play footy with which girls like let's <laughs> be going on here birding yeah get some birding done as my chance to fit back in with the group i decided i would mention about my two school cricket hundreds I made in England back in 2015. Fuck, I peaked too early. Which saw these two mates pull out their phones, which have them both raising their bats on their lock screens. Could you love yourself anymore? So my questions to you are, one, yes, they both made first grade my hundreds, but did myself, the third grader, have a better night due to my ability to get a chop? Two, do I continue to hang out with these blokes and continue to call them my best mates, knowing all too well that I will never get to score a one a first grade 100? Three, should I stick to my promising amateur footy career where I show these two blokes up week after week? Four, does my dad love me? Thank you for your time. And please help me find some decent mates who share the same cricketing ability as me. Kind regards an average third grader. Also, it's Gosnell's Cricket Club and Jet Shaw has been replaced in keeping duties by yours truly. <laughs> Thanks, Jacob. Uh, and yeah, for those who are asking about why I mentioned Gosnell's, um, if you're new to the show, a few months ago, I forgot their name. And um, ended up calling them Gollum Cricket yeah, Club. So, right. um, which made a few waves. Uh, and as we know, Jet Shaw fucks. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. We know that now. It's a good name, but he's lost his keeping spot. Unfortunately, to Jacob. Do you think that matters if your name's Jet Shaw? You wouldn't have thought so. No. Just so, we're looking at done. hundreds in ones at the Wacker, for example. Pretty a bit good. of carry on from the blokes who got hundreds, but they're not great on the circuit. Mm. Versus a third grader who's jealous of that of that hundred, not as good at cricket, but plays footy and girls like him more. Mm. And the question is who who's who's better basically? Yeah, what's it's, what's it's a binary what do you world, want? Yeah. I mean, do you do you have a, a view on that? I'd trade in a lot for a hundred on the whacker. 
what would you trade in? <laughs> what circuit privileges and all the things to do with circuits would you trade in for 100 on the would I? Like, would you trade in some height on your body? Would you trade in some rig? Would you trade in? <laughs> I would trade in. I, I would trade in six months of celibacy. No, that's not enough. It's not enough. A year. Would you be an incel for two years? No, nah, that's too long. An involu- would you be involu- <laughs> Would you be involuntarily <laughs> celibate to score 100 on the whacker? How, for how long? Two years. No, nah, not two years. Really? Two years without sex to, to score 100 on the whacker? How that story forever? A year. 18 months. 14. <laughs> <laughs> Is it chanceless? Yes, it's chanceless. Oh, 18. Chanceless 100 on the whacker you against know, Cameron... Sorry. Cameron Gannon. <laughs> yeah. For, oh, go- yeah. for Gollum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good bunch of boys. Is Jet Shaw my mate? Jet Shaw's your mate and you, he, he, he flogs you on the circuit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Fuck, ah, okay. 14 months. Jet Shaw's my mate. 100 on the whack. 15 months. That last month will really kill me. Yeah, that's better. I think um, I, that's what I trade in. Okay. Would you? No, I'm not gonna say that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> fuck. I was just talking about penis size, but um, yeah, that was right. silly. In uh, too big to fail. <laughs> 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 Nobody has it better than Joe Burns. He's too big to fail. <laughs> exactly. I think in cricket environments, third grade can never beat first grade, socially, physically, spiritually, emotionally, economically. Uh, being a third grader, like doesn't matter if you've got a better rig, if you do better on the circuit. Mm. Uh, I mean, you've experienced this. Um, a first grader will always be above you in the apex in the in the food chain. Yeah, of course. Like, and so even if you have a better night on the circuit, mm. Jacob, and the blokes are you know might be a bit more awkward or whatever and a bit more nerdy or nuffy about cricket. If they've got a hundred on the whacker, they're just ahead of you. Just and, ahead. and I no, play footy. Nobody doesn't thinks, matter. Yeah, that doesn't matter. In every other environment, but cricket environments, you're good. You're way they're, they're no one. They're yeah. absolutely nobody. They're actually lesser. Yeah. They're actually lesser people. They're actually laughed at. Yeah, they are. Uh, and um, should be embarrassed. Yes. To be who they, they are. They should be embarrassed for who they are. They are. They don't know that. The more runs they score, the more time they dedicate to cricket, the more embarrassed they should be are in any environment outside cricket. Yeah. Mm. You're doing really well. Balanced life, like to play a bit of footy, girls yeah. like it, good movement. Mm. I played a three, bit of threes cricket too. That's good. Oh, you must be able to play a little bit. Mm. That's fine. Mm. But once you're in that cricket environment, you're no one. Mm. And the problem is cricket now goes for about seven months a year. Yeah. So enjoy those five months mm. um, because other than that, yeah, you're you're low on uh, the uh, feudal system. Yep. You're a, you're a pauper. If you're not first, you're last. You're, le- you're a leper. Um, and yes, Jacob, your dad loves you. Well. Your dad loves you, Jacob. I didn't say that. Xavier Frawley writes in, Dear Higrat and Pezzy Boy, Boys, on a recent on a recent rainy and hungover Sunday, I made the bizarre and unexplainable decision to take a trip down memory lane and review every scorecard from my grade career on my cricket. I was shocked at how much I remembered from these games and how looking at these scorecards tri- triggered some enjoyable and horrifying memories. Mm. Most poignantly, the time I rode off my parents' car the night before a game, had to catch a cab to the ground and started the day with a 13 ball over, finishing with 12 individual wides in four overs for the day, a haunting memory I have actively blocked out for nine years. To provide some context, I was an opening bowler who hated facing the short ball. After a season in England and reaching the pinnacle of cricket, ones in Melbourne Test Cricket for MCC, I moved to Sydney to study medicine and had a brief career in Sydney grade cricket highlighted by two trips to Benson's Lane. Yuck. Unfortunately, I missed the chance to play against Higos as he was playing threes and I was playing twos. Sorry, Chief. His pair that day almost certainly contributed to that being his last season. I have happily, I've been happily retired for the last four years. However, like the beating drum in Jumanji, the original Robin Williams R.I.P., <laughs> Thoughts of returning to the game are growing ever more intrusive. So my question is this. What the fuck is wrong with me? Why can't I bury the emotional pull to return to the game like like I uh, can so successfully with every other emotion? And how can I resist its magnetism to maintain control of my Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays, and occasionally Sundays? Love the cast, and thanks for your help. Yours in cricket nuffery, Frawls. I don't think this is... I don't think Frawls is going to play again. Can you please address the 
direct comments made about you. Firstly, before we go into into that, he's um, had a pop, or you're just gonna you're gonna. I've spoken about that. I've spoken about this game in the past. This was one of the worst games of my entire life. Yeah. Um. Well, what about then? Just for all just saying, I played two. You're playing three. Sorry, chief. He's chiefed you. All good. Anything? Oh wow. Oh, peace and love. Seasons greetings. All and good. that's good. All good. That's good. Wow. Why are you shaking at the moment? Oh, I'm about to fucking rip the cunt. Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> There's a tear going down your eye. Um, no, that that game, um, I dropped a guy on zero who then's got one of the fastest 130s I've ever seen. He, he must have hit 12, 13 sixes. Incredible. Really incredible batting. And then about two weeks later, he was playing first grade. So I contributed to him playing first grade. You're welcome, young man. He was, he was like 16, 17 as well. Um, I got a pair that day. And we'd just written the first book, and one of the guys, <laughs> uh, and one of the guys, oh, one of the guys, I'm talking so before, and yeah. one of the guys in my team brought a book, and I was sitting outside the um, the Sydney Union dressing rooms at the time. I was playing for Gordon, my club, and the door was open. And, like we we won the game of first innings, but anyway, it was a fucking grim day. The second day, and then this guy brought his brought the book home. And he asked me to sign it, and I was like, yeah, I've just got a fucking pair. Drop this guy. In. I think I dropped three catches. I was a fuck. It was a horrendous day. So yes, it did contribute to the not uh, the worst sort of uh, follow up though to getting a pair. Oh well, at least I'm signing books about it. <laughs> yeah, at least I'm making money from the thing. My dad just walks home. <laughs> um, but yeah, Frawls, um, I don't think Frawls is going to play because he's got too much other going on in his life. Like he's doing some medicine. <sighs> You know, he's probably of age now where he's, he would have more things in his life to be playing. Is that not – do you know what I mean? Like, he'd be, he'd be minimum late 20s, I'd imagine. He's probably early 30s. Yeah. He played twos and threes at Sydney Uni. I looked him up at Margaret. Now, that's a tough existence. What the what – the, what the thing is, I, I, I think like, you know when you go down the, the the rabbit hole of looking at scorecards in my cricket. That's like yeah, going do, that's yeah. going like on TikTok where it just fucking scrolls the next thing, the next thing because one memory will trigger another memory. Then you start looking at other people's stats who you hated, or like one game you played well. Then you harp up back to the good times, and it triggers a memory of like, oh, I used to be good, but you were never good, really. We all just had like one or two good days a summer. Are we permitting? And, and if you play long enough, then you can have like five or six good memories. Are we permitting the term Melbourne Test cricket? No. No, it, that's not the thing. Yeah, so rule that out. He played ones there, but twos and threes in Sydney. So His MCC probably says it all. That's Melbourne Cricket Club, right? Yeah, that's where Pekovsky yeah. and um, he played at the the like the prestige villainous clubs of ah, Melbourne and Sydney. Yeah, okay, right, right, yeah. right, right, right. Studies medicine. You get the, the cricket, the, the cricket, the cricket's good here, isn't it? It in must Melbourne, be good. Just, good. just, just by yeah. sheer population. Yeah, yeah, it's good. Yeah, it's good. It's good. But it's, it's not, a Sydney, it's not so test Sydney, Sydney Test cricket. Yeah. Yeah. Um. So I guess the question for Frawls is, yeah, how, how can you resist its magnetism? Well, I looked up on my cricket Frawls and I just reckon just keep looking through those scorecards because <laughs> it ain't pretty. Um, yeah. But I love you and thanks for the support. Okay. Okay. Do you want to do one more? Let's do one more. Okay. That's the guy CDC Fridays. Hello, Piz and Higrat. This is from Anonymous. This is my first time to write in. As you know, the cricket season has started and I found myself in a predicament. Having done decently in 2020s in two, scoring 60 and 42, 39 in my cricket. So am I allowed to say I scored 40 odd? To someone when they can full they can full go they can full well go and check my scores and know I'm lying. Mm. Long parentheses. Yeah. Anyway. Glad he closed it though. Yeah. Anyway, I've been asked to play first grade for the one-day games due to injuries, and as a selector say, due to my performances and constant training attendance. What what they are trying to say is you're going to bat seven and fill a hole in the field and not bowl because you're 17 and obviously would kill for a spot in ones. Mm -hmm. Would it be wrong or downright blasphemous to turn down a first grade spot just to be able to bat up the order and get more of an opportunity in twos? Is that selfish to not help out, or is it sensible to want to actually do something on my Saturdays and potentially score runs? Or... Should I take it as an honour to be playing ones and even try and take a spot up the batting order? Thanks for the help. Love the podcast, Anonymous. Well, Anonymous, it, this is an interesting one. Like, it, on the one hand, like I sort of admire the question in a lot of ways because this is a this is a, a very pure approach to the game. I mean, this is someone who's saying like they are actually tempted by having a better experience of simply playing regardless of grade. So like, I'm going to get a better opportunity in twos to simply play the game. Now, You're 17, that's, that's a, very self-aware. It's very foreign to me that grade cricket is anything other than a status-seeking experience. Yeah. Somebody offers you a spot in first grade, people would give their left arm 
uh, for that kind of spot because yeah. once you earn that cap, that's a story and that's an identity for life. And you played first grade at 17. You played first grade at 17. Now, for many people, just that sentence would bring more happiness and satisfaction than any amount of runs you'll score in twos because any time mm. you talk about runs you score in twos, somebody will say when trying to calculate your skill as a cricketer, what grade was it? Yeah. What grade was it? Yeah. Whereas when you play ones, having done it, nobody asks how many runs you made or anything, which is great from my perspective. <laughs> <laughs> so the pre my cricket era. You it's, know? It's, so it's, just it's much better one. to be shit in first grade than be shit in second grade. But that presumes that cricket is an identity rather than simply a, a game. <laughs> the deciding factor here this is, silly is, fucking is, idea. is this is if this is actually grade cricket. Yeah. If this, oh, is, some, if this, is, if this is another one oh, where it's on. like – it's just like, oh, oh um, no. he, he, boys, here's, here's a great, great cricket story. Yeah. Uh, we turned up and the Astro pitch was underwater. What the fuck is that shit? What the fuck is that shit? Fuck out of here with fuck that shit. Fuck out of here with that shit. You that ain't great cricket, you fucking dopey cunt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. I take all of that back. No, but if you're no, playing some no, but, fucking no, Astro if, sub-district bullshit. But if Anonymous is actually playing grade cricket. Yeah. Then like he has to play first spot. grade at 17. He, I mean, he, the thing is though, he's ultimately going to play first grade at some point. If he's 17 in the picture, even if yeah. he's just filling in through injuries. I don't know. The average age is coming down. Maybe he's old. Yeah. Maybe that's, that's, a, that's a good point. Yeah. That's a good well, point. And also anonymous back yourself, brother. You score runs in twos. You're going to get, get a spot at seven. Go and score some runs. Mm. Come on. And just enjoy scoring runs in first grade. Mm. It's quite a big jump to first. Quite a big second. jump, actually. Quite a, yeah, quite a big no, jump, you're right. So. They, you're definitely being taken advantage of, <laughs> and it's good of you to realise that. And that's why you won't play for too much longer because you, you're obviously yeah. self aware enough to you, realise you've, that you've got rounds left. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I reckon take the game in once, take the game, and then retire. Get the fuck out. Get out. Uh, Merry Christmas to you and to yours, and yours. Sam Perry, and to mine. Uh, and uh, all the people out there across the world. Mm. Thanks to Michael Bevan. Thank you very much Bevan. to Michael Bevan. Merry Christmas to him as well. Yeah. Uh, Everyone who backed us this year. I mean, I feel like just pre-Christmas, I just feel like shouting that out. Who got, who got in and around and behind the and next. on top of us. <laughs> Critically, verbally, as, as many people like to do. Thank you very much, guys. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, we'll see you, the Patreons on Thursday, Christmas Eve, and we'll see you guys next week. Cheers.